Well, we thought that since this is going to be a conference about security tokens, that it would be appropriate to talk about custody and transfer agents that play a huge role in securities in the regular securities market today. So um, we have put together this panel of transfer agents and custodians to, to kind of enlighten you a little bit about what these roles are uh, that, the, that these organizations play in today's market. So um, I was wondering that perhaps we can start um, with you, Scott, about, about talking about um, you know, what does a custodian do uh, in, and why is, is there a role for custodians? It seems that you know, in a trust company like yours, you're based in Nevada and you have a, a license from the state of Nevada to provide these services and it seems to me that, um, that, there's, that there's a huge role for you guys to play. You already custody equities, bonds, cash. What is it that, um, that makes your role so essential in this token economy? Well, there's really two things that, uh, that we provide in terms of custody. First, as a trust company, our, we are tasked by regulators with holding and protecting a wide variety of asset classes, cash, real estate, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and of course, alternative assets, private business interests, partnership interests, royalty interests, and securities tokens. The reason it's really important is twofold. One, for uh, SEC reporting entities like hedge funds, uh, venture funds, investment advisors, they are required by regulation to hold all of their assets, not just digital tokens, stocks, bonds, cash, all of their assets must be held with a qualified custodian which under SEC rules is either a bank or a clearing broker. That's it. No one else uh, meets that designation. Trust companies are by rule a bank. So that's why trust companies like Prime Trust uh, hold those assets for broker dealers and hedge funds and others. We, aside from that, so the people who are required to hold all of their assets with qualified custodians, there's also a convenience factor. Most people, if they own stocks or bonds, don't have a whole bunch of stocks or bonds and pieces of paper in their drawer at home. They have an account at E-Trade or Schwab or Robinhood or whatever. And in doing that, they get a single statement with all of their assets. Likewise, in this case, people who are investing in multiple, uh, uh, multiple offerings, multiple ICOs, STOs. I had a family office I was talking to the other day they're not required to file by qualified custodial rules. But the guy said, you know, we've got all this money we're putting, we're buying all these uh, uh, securities tokens on secondary markets and an original, and we're juggling a whole bunch of wallets, and can I just give it all to you and you put it on a statement for me and I don't have to think about it? And the answer is, yeah, that's exactly what we can do. So it's both regulatory and convenience, and then throw the convenience into uh, allowing exchanges to be able to conduct transactions within our ecosystem so there's no risk, everything is kept in cold storage and we can settle immediately, then it starts helping this entire industry come to life based on what custodians do. So see, there was something very important that was, that was in there, which is that custodianship allows for institutional players to basically enter the space. Without custodians, there are no institutional players like mutual funds or hedge funds coming into the space. So do you, do you see a lot of inquiries from those type of players about the services that you provide today? Do you see a lot of interest coming into this field? They're still coming up to speed. The, uh, the largest institutional players, the, the problem is usually, uh, and look at J.P. Morgan Chase, great organization, the CEO is adverse to a lot of things, but their whole, uh, they have teams of people in blockchain and doing things. So in many organizations, uh, even some of the institutional, you'll see the compliance people uh, and broker dealers as well. You see the compliance people really dragging things down, but there's initiatives. So this is all, there's been, uh, the last panel they were just talking about how 2018 things are getting going, 2019 will be accelerating, but this is gonna be a multi-year process, and I totally agree with that. It's gonna take a while, so yeah. Um, if I were a large holder of any equity, of any company, 
I would be subject to short swing profit rules, which means that if I sell these securities within a period of time of buying them, then you know, I can get, I can basically pay a fine for doing so. How would a custodian be able to help out a player such as that? Well, if you're, if you're gonna commit a regulatory infraction, then we're doing no different than that person's clearing firm be doing. We're just accepting buy and sell orders. Right. Where uh, the thing that uh, a custodian helps with and that people aren't thinking enough about is people are helping, we have a, a lot of people that are within our ecosystem like Polymath and Harbor and uh, Republic and Coinless and Start Engine and you know, great, great uh, companies helping people um, get their securities sold, the, uh, tokenizing the securities and sell them. But if people hold these themselves on their own wallets in their own name, and if they get them listed on an exchange and they start trading, there's a very good chance that you're quickly going to hit 2,000 or more shareholders or securities holders of record, and that will trigger 12G registration with the SEC. And unless you're a multi-billion dollar company, you likely cannot afford the cost of 12G registration. If the issuer has all of their securities held with a custodian, then they could have millions of, of uh, beneficial owners, but the shareholder of record count for SEC rules is one, just the custodian. So by using a custodian, you can avoid 12G issues, which is really important, actually, and not being talked about enough. And um, you you all, you are, sorry, um, you are with Restock, and um, and you provide a separate set of services that are also very important and and, and for for the industry. And Oscar's firm does as well. And I was wondering whether you could explain what the role of a transfer agent is, specifically with regards to a world where um, where every token, security token, will be held in a wallet uh, that belongs to a person. So presumably, the issuer would know who that wallet owner is. So it's, a, it's actually very interesting. When Scott just mentioned that you know people don't hold paper, I come from the traditional securities industry, practicing securities law for too long. Um, we are registered with the SEC as a transfer agent. We deal with a lot of traditional companies that haven't moved onto the digital side that currently exists, let alone tokens. We still have companies that insist on issuing paper stock certificates, although we say don't do that, you know, it's, it's a mistake. Because there, there, there are technologies in place that let you avoid it, DWAC, DRS, through the DTC systems. But that's where we're coming to, and we're kind of, uh, we, we see our role as trying to bridge the gap to try to you know, explain to the industry, you know, and Scott talks about avoiding 12G, 12G. If you're required under 12G and we see people putting these caps in, if you pass that threshold, the SEC requires you to retain a transfer agent. You know, the SEC believes in this trusted advisor. They believe that they need somebody overseeing your market, which is why they have custodians. And if you're not dealing, if you're not at that level, you have to have a transfer agent to manage your shareholder records. What that means in a token world is completely different than what it means in a traditional securities role, but the, the role is still a necessary function in order to operate as a, as a compliant token. Wow. We both have the same to say, right? <laughs> it's great. Uh, you know, I agree 100% with you all. And, uh, and Scott, we all know each other for uh, we took a different approach. Uh, we saw the, the tokenization as being the, the it is the, the, the new coming of democratizing capital, if you heard David Wheel and others speak. So, and the issue of being a transfer agent, we have this big responsibility. I mean, you know, we use the word custody and, and somebody said, well, we can make that into a robot or a technology. Well. I, I, I would like to say at this moment, that's just not gonna happen. It's, there is some responsibilities that we have. So therefore, at CoreConnex, we uh, created a fully globally compliant security token that as a TA, as a transfer agent, custodian, we could meet our obligations, not just in the United States, but other countries that we operate in. Because the, the, the punishment that we would have 
uh, alongside with the issuers and whether they're breaching the, the, uh, uh, the number of holders and all that, it, it would be severe in both ends. And as much as I liked, I'm sure many of you are sitting in the room and listening to what Scott is saying, well, if you exceed 2,000 holders, uh, you, you know, you'll breach a 12G uh, and so forth. And some will say, well, wait a minute, I can write that into a smart contract, it'll never happen. Um, well, technology is fantastic, but we all know technology can be forked or can be a hack and so forth. So those uncertainties, that's where the custodians come in. So we, we have to be able to manage all that. And keep in mind as well that we're not just managing the security element, that's in the TA, obviously Scott manages more, but we're also managing the book of records of the company. We're doing all the other corporate actions that you know, you'll know, tell you. There's just other obligations the company needs to meet. You know, your, uh, uh, your reporting, your, your annual uh, meetings with your shareholders. However you do that, that's where your transfer agent partner and this ecosystem uh, plays out. And none of these platforms like Start Engine, Republic or others would have survived if a lot of these companies, like uh, the three of us, uh, became innovative enough to get plugged in. And tokenization is not going to change that. Tokenization is going to, it's going to excel quite well, but it's going to need to understand that it, it's not going to replace this element of the securities requirement, not only in the United States, I want to be very clear, not only in the United States, it's an obligation in Canada, it's an obligation in Australia, it's an obligation in many countries around the world, not just for accredited, but also non-accredited investors. So, especially when we're selling security tokens in different jurisdictions, it, it, it's important to keep that in mind. Yeah, remember that, uh, you know, the three of us have had this conversation that a lot of people in the digital economy are saying, well, we don't want to use a transfer agent. Like, well, you don't have a choice. If you're a reg A, or if you're a, a full filing, or if you go broach 12G, you have to use a transfer agent. It's by regulation. And people go, well, it doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have to do that. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make sense. I, I mean, it's the yeah. rule. <laughs> yeah. Here's the reality. So I have a friend who used to be on the board of directors of FINRA, and we bumped into each other in a coffee shop, and he's advising uh, broker dealers who want to form an ATS. He goes, I said, so let's talk. He goes, well, why do I need a transfer agent? The records are mutable. And everybody knows that, you know, that's a good buzzword in the blockchain. I go, yes, that may be true, but one, you know, it's required by the regulation. And two, I mean, the transfer agent brings a role that, you know, we've all come from the Jobs Act era, the crowdfunding, reggae. You know, we've taken companies public through reggae. At the end of the day, they're still an investor. You know, m probably not institutional, maybe mom and pop, maybe its own securities, maybe haven't. You know, we took a company public and we had, you know, thousands of individual investors who all of a sudden, all right, I have this investment, now what do I do? And that's one thing that we do is we work with the companies to be able to interact with these investors to kind of educate them and explain the process. All right, now you're a security holder. What would you like to do? How do you do it? And that's kind of a, a role that we take as well in actually interacting with the shareholders on a regular basis. Constantly, right? You're constantly doing that. And that, I think it's, uh, and I applaud the companies that actually uh, bring on people that will act as their investor relations. Uh, liaison between themselves and their companies, Reggae Plus issuers, I've seen quite a bit. I got a few of those clients that they've embedded their shareholders as part of their business, but I am their transfer agent. I am the custodian. Uh, it's all digital, just like you all is, and many, they log into my platform. They don't even see a phys uh, physical certificate. I already tokenized them from the day they started with us. So to them, I mean, it, it's all the hype about blockchain, but the reality, the average, the average day investor who invested $100, $1,000, or so forth, does not see the actual blockchain itself. All they care about is that if anything happens, my goodness, what about beneficiary owner, I mean, or joint ownership? I get, after they make the investment for $50, they go, oh my God, I want this under my husband and wife. <laughs> you all and I. And you know, it, it's all of these items and then all the corporate actions behind it. You know, there, uh, here is something that people must always remember. A security is not uh, uh, definitive until the board of directors of a corporation approves it. A, a board of directors, 
An entity has corporate directors that authorize the issuance of capital, whether it's a security or anything, and they're the only ones that can accept it. One thing is accepting the money and then giving some, but ultimately uh, the board of directors resolution, and the, they're the only ones that can actually indicate what can and cannot happen. And that direction is, is, it needs to be managed. And that's, uh, like I said, it, it's, you know, one word I've heard a lot uh, in the last few days is that we're kind of the people that we want to keep things the way they are. I cannot tell you how much I need to tell you this, that it's exactly what we don't want. We've been trying to change this from 2011. Yeah. 2011. You know, look at Howard Marks, one of the few people, Republic, is starting to, to put a platform online when people said it would never work, and it's working. So tokenization needs to understand that there is a framework there that understands how to do that and protect investors. The investor protection must be our number one priority today for tokenization to occur. And tokenization is going to survive and get to the institutional side 100% guaranteed, I promise you that, if you can bring the custodianship element. It will never come, never, it will never come ever. And if you think that the, the crowd has more money than the institutional side, you only have to listen to David Wheel's keynote. The trillions of dollars are sitting at JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, are sitting at the banks. And that money isn't gonna flow until they have trust. They need to have that trust. So we, we were talking now about, about um, companies that are publicly traded, Reg A, or even differently registered, right, just a regular IPO. But what about private companies? So in the, pa in, you know, in the past, in the recent past with ICOs, issuers um, issued these tokens under an agreement called a SAFT, which in our company stands for a simple agreement for future trouble. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so, um, but but, um, but uh, now with with more companies choosing uh, the Reg D route or a private placement route, and actually wanting to issue the tokens directly to the holders, there's a problem because in in the past you got a piece of paper like this, and it said you know this security, any transfer of this security shall be null and void unless you come to me, the issuer first, you deliver um, a, a, an opinion of counsel that's reasonably satisfactory to us. Well, now, now, now in the US, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so now you have a Reg D token that's issued to anybody here, right? Yeah. And the issuer has to make sure that that person doesn't transfer it to another person who's not accredited. How, does, how do your roles help an issuer with that, um, uh, maintaining that process. Well, it's, it starts yeah. with, yeah, it, it generally starts with uh, the companies who are helping them write the smart contracts because you can build Rule 144 restrictions into the smart contract. Uh, if you're doing it as a Reg S, a lot of people run a Reg D and a Reg S concurrently. So the Reg D for US investors and the Reg S for the rest of the world, and there's a lot less restrictions on the Reg S. So you'd have to write that logic into and to who might want to transfer it and where is it going. The, uh, you know, the reality is that obviously if they're using a custodian, then we're in charge of enforcing those restrictions uh, that are on the securities. The, if they're using uh, direct registration with the transfer agent, then the transfer agent will enforce that. And I don't take words out of these guys' mouth. Yeah, I, I mean, the only thing I was gonna add, all, my, all our business is private. I don't do public companies. If I do, they go, uh, you know, that's where I, I draw the line at the private company. So I am all about the private world. My Reg A plus clients are private. They want to be private, but guess what? Shareholders can trade. Shareholders can trade. They can start trading the minute it closes. That's the holy grail of the regulation. And the nice thing about this regulation in the United States, uh, it's available to Canadian and U.S. issuers or domicile corporation, and they can sell their securities to anybody in the world. You know, and, and I'll say that we've taken a different approach. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and we all saw what was going on in 2017 and a little bit in the beginning of 2018. And I always questioned, I wonder, I said, all right, they've all met these exemptions. They've issued restricted securities. Did they really build in the restrictions in the smart contracts? And I wonder, and I said, forget about what happened in 2017. I want to see what happened six months, a year from now, when people said, all right, I bought it. And after the traditional securities regulations, 
they're unrestricted, you know, now I want my liquidity on what's gonna happen to those shareholders now. Was it, you know, the SEC and people who are filing now are going back to say, all right, you wanna be registered now, you wanna do a Reg A now, but let's see, did you comply when you did that's your true. previous your offerings? Previous, right. you know? yep. And yep. that's gonna be an issue for those who, you know, entered into the, to the ICO space, you know, because now we're a whole new space, but those who entered into the ICO space, you know, and, and built it out and did these offerings that weren't really compliant, the SEC is gonna go and look back at that. And it's gonna be interesting to see how those convert into the real marketplace. Well, it's, it's funny, I, I was just speaking with uh, our colleagues at Templum, uh, an ATS uh, a secondary market here in New York, and I was telling him, you know, there's a number of issues, and he goes, that's all great, Oscar, the, 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 the front end, you know, they raised their money, I'm, I'm all excited about that, but to your point, we need to look back exactly how that money was raised, because the, the consequences in the ecosystem are that if, if anybody along the way did not properly constitute an offering properly, they, it, it just has a, a negative effect all the way through. So um, we obviously all take our responsibilities uh, very high, and we apply technology to make it happen. So this doesn't mean that you slow the process down. It's that once you understand what it is and you apply a technology that can make that happen, then you have something that you can actually rely on. But it does not take away the role. The role is a physical role, a physical entity, because all of you in this room, if you get mad or you get angry, what do you do? You call your lawyer and you sue. You want accountability. All those ICOs that lost billions of dollars, where's your accountability? There is none. They can all say all the free trading decentralization, but at the end of the day, none of these people have a single claim anywhere for any of that money they've lost. In securities world, you have a claim. So the blockchain traditionalists don't like to hear that. I know, you know but it's the reality, But right? the SEC loves throwing out the terminology, you know, that a transfer agent is a gatekeeper, you know, and that our role is to provide some oversight, to make sure that the market, that securities in the marketplace belong in the marketplace. And while it was brought up earlier, it's a matter of time till the SEC, you know, uh, amends the regulations. <laughs> I, I'll tell you the transfer agent regulations are 20 or 30 years out of date. And about five years ago, they put up a, it, it wasn't even a pro, rules, pro, rule proposal. They said, we don't know what to do. Here's about 300 things that we can look at. What do you guys think? It's been sitting there for five years now. Yeah. So if we are gonna wait for the SEC to change the regulations, good luck. You know, that means we're all gonna be sitting on the sidelines for the next 10 years plus. You know? Agreed, agreed. And the players, you guys, if you want to change the world on that end, you have to convince the bigger players. AST, ComputerShare, those two companies own 99% of the world's transfer business. They're not, and believe me, they're, they got the year. But I'll uh, tell you, yeah. I, I go to conferences with AST, you know, and after I go to a token conference, I went to a traditional conference, you know, they're just recognizing, and I, it's funny, I just got a newsletter yesterday from, from the Securities Transfer Association. Okay. There's finally an article, Equinity, uh, 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 existed after Wells Fargo. They said, hey, maybe it's time to look at blockchain. Well, where have you been? You know, everybody's already looking at it. You've been sitting on the sidelines because, again, I've also talked with DTC, who, for those who don't know, is the backbone of NASDAQ, you know, New York Stock Exchange, the OTC. You know, for them, they were patting themselves on their back this year because they went from three days to two days in, in clearing securities. You know, they're not jumping on the blockchain bandwagon either because right now they have control over the trillion dollar marketplace that currently exists. It's gonna take time and you need people who are nimble and are looking at this place and, and ready to move in. Yeah, we, one of the topics was uh, the first, uh, you know, what David Will was saying is part of the technology. Uh, it, all of their stuff at DTC is written in Fortran. Yeah. Well, let's, let's go back to 1981 here, shall we? Uh, yeah. You know, one thing I wanna point out uh, a lot of people may be sitting there in the audience going, you know, gee, because I would, this was me a couple of years ago, as these guys know. It's like, oh, how hard is it to put together a cap table management system? I mean, I can have one of my engineers knock that out in, you know, a couple of days. Not a big deal. Oh, and then I have to become a registered transfer agent, and I, I file a piece of paper with the SEC. 
That's it? Awesome, easy. So we had done that. We had created a registered transfer agent within uh, my predecessor company, Fund America, which Prime Trust acquired. But we had created that uh, transfer agent. And then we're getting ready for our first examination. Uh, my guys are like, well, we have to comply with all these SEC rules that are tailored towards the public markets. Like, yeah, but they shouldn't apply because uh, the only thing the transfer agent is doing is private securities, like what Oscar's doing. So none of those apply. And <laughs> to your point, it, the SEC came in and said, yeah, you're right. It, they don't make sense, they don't apply, but it's the only rules we have. We haven't written new rules, so therefore you're subject to, as a transfer agent, the same operations as a VSTOC or a computer share or someone like that that handles publicly traded securities. And that is ridiculously overwhelming. And at that point, said, yeah, we're not gonna do this anymore. And we turned over, because we had to decide, are we in the transfer agent business or are we in the compliance and custody business? We're not in the transfer agent business. These guys are. Great, let them do that. And we focus on our, our stuff. And, and I'm not sure if I told you, I mean, when the SEC comes to do their regular audit, and I'm probably gonna get, audit, you know, it's a regular thing. You know, the first time it happened, it was surprising. You know, an employee came to my office and said, are the SEC here? They go, okay, transfer the phone call, I'll talk to them. They go, no, they're here. I went to the, uh, the door, there were two examiners from the SEC, they said, okay, where can we sit? I had to clear out a desk for them, and they didn't leave my office for two months. So that is kind of the oversight that we're subject to and why they turn to us as the trusted advisor. And as much as we're, you know, and I, I love the quote and I say it, we're centralizing a decentralized system, that right now is the reality, at least in the United States. Yeah, for everyone uh, in here who is new to regulation, uh, usually coming out of the technology space, that is one thing. The SEC, FINRA, Banking Commissioner, FinCEN's uh, enforcement arm, little company called the IRS, uh, uh, FBI, all the uh, state's attorneys, generals, they tend to just walk in the door. They usually don't call and say, hey, is it okay if we come over? Do you have space for us? And they don't usually walk in alone. It's usually with a team. So if you're in a regulated uh, business, which I expect most people are, you can expect these visits uh, during the year. So let, if we can just maybe switch a little from, from the, the maintenance of, of, this, uh, of the uh, registry of owners and, and the custodianship of these assets. If I'm an issuer and I've issued these securities, I have ongoing disclosure obligations. Right, so I have to, if I'm public, I have to make periodic disclosures, but I may want to make disclosures anyway to inform my stakeholders about what's going on with the company. How, what if any role do you guys play in helping an issuer get that information to the holders of the tokens? Well, in our platform, uh, it's an all-in-one, so not only are we a transfer agent to uh, Scott's point, we also have a, a cap table management we have an investor relations uh, tool uh, feature with it that allows you to communicate with your shareholders. It allows you to send your news releases, uh, reports. It's all confidential, but one by one. It's got online e-voting, online proxy, um, and the investor has an entire portfolio management dashboard. You can call it a wallet, but they don't hold a wallet. They leave it there, um, and they can view all that information. So we are assisting from that perspective. Uh, the other uh, perspective are security token protocol uh, that has artificial intelligence built in depending on the regulations and the number of jurisdictions they sold their securities in. They will have uh, obligations of reporting. And like any entrepreneur, you're so busy running up your business, you tend to forget what needs to get done. And so the, the, the token itself within the platform creates triggers to tell you what you need to do and abide. You'll still need your lawyers in some cases. You'll still need other advisors to complete it. In some cases, you can do it yourself. As a private company, you have not as high a threshold of, of, uh, of reporting, but within our ecosystem, with our broker dealers, if you sign on with us and use <coughs> our token, you will have to meet a threshold of, of public disclosures in order to create this mechanism of liquidity and trust uh, that isn't often required by regulators, but it's required within our ecosystem ourselves. Well, even if you're even if you're 
private. If you went out with Reg CF or yes. Reg A, uh, you know, talk to Howard here. He can give you the uh, start engine. Yes. He can give you the stories on that. You still have reporting obligations, even though you're not a public company. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. You know, people forget. Okay, I, I've closed in, in the old world. I closed my IPO. Great. Let's all pat each other on the back. Well, now you have obligations. Now you have stakeholders and you have shareholders. It's not going to be that much different if you close your STO. All of a sudden, you now invited potentially thousands of individuals into what you're doing. You know, and we've had companies say, well, what if we want to pay a dividend airdrop? I go, oh, that's great. We can help you with that and all that. I go, don't forget the IRS. Oh, there's tax obligations now. <laughs> it's like you forget about the little things that have existed for years in the traditional world that have to be brought into the tokenized world as well. And how, how would that work in terms of an issuer wanting to pay out a dividend or make an interest payment to its token holders so using the, your platform? There are people who are building it into the smart contract. Again, this all goes back to, and, and again, we're looking at the public spaces, you know, how you build your smart contract. We've built in you know, our, our systems to interact with smart contracts, to be able to communicate and to be able to provide airdrops and, and do all, all these additional uh, components which a traditional transfer agent has always done and assisted with. I mean, one thing that's fascinating, and I, you know, I, I, I read a uh, Congre congressional release, you know, the one hope is that, you know, we'll get more transparencies. One of the complaints that Congress has always had is that, you know, the CEO's management of public companies had no idea who their beneficial holders were. Yes. And they're hoping that with the advent of blockchain, you know, the records are out there that will get more transparency so there is more direct communication without a lot of DTCs, clearing firms, and things that usually would hamper that direct communication. Agreed. You know what? That, that's a great closing. Uh, the going back, we'll go back a few years, yeah. okay? Going back to the, the early days of the Jobs Act being created, people like Scott, uh, you know, David Weald and many others. I mean, the whole vision was to change that public mindset that, you know, the, the invested, the company that got that money had no idea who that holder was and that, you know, whether they invested a thousand dollars. The whole Jobs Act, it connected us. It, we were directly connected to the companies. The companies knew who their holders were. You could engage with them. But all of that, you know, people call that, well, that's social media and so on. But there are obligations why we do it. And there is a beneficial uh, uh, to both the company and the shareholder. And if we get to the point where we can graduate a company from being private to public seamlessly through a blockchain, that would be amazing. I mean, as I said, at the moment, I stop at the private side just because I realize that in the public world, it's going to take a little bit longer. In the private world, we have, a, we, we have this opportunity of a fragmented industry that can actually change things. We really can. And we can have what the blockchain uh, crypto world has always foreseen. You know, let's democratize it. Let's give everybody an opportunity to invest. We all want that but we need to do it within the guidelines in which they're out there and it can get done. And that's where I, I get excited because when I see my clients fully engaged with their 86,000 shareholders because of the Jobs Act and they see the value and those shareholders buying more shares all the time, that's what this was intended for. And all we're doing, we're just gonna call it a token from now on. That's it, it's that simple, nothing more. So would it be correct for most people to just think about tokens as just being the newer form of a dematerialized security? Agreed. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'd like to think it's more than just a newer form. If we're going to have the same security and we're just slapping a different name on it, then why go through the effort? I mean, no. I, I, I love reading the stories about the functionality being built into the tokens. The utility aspects excite me. They make the SEC nervous. But from, you know, let's be honest, a securities nerd like myself, I like to see more than just calling it, you know, a simple equity. Although, let's be honest, if you're going to make your token a little convoluted right now, you're going to have a tough time explaining it to the SEC. And you need to keep yeah. it easy in the beginning until they can accept where the marketplace is going. It's just the token just reduces friction for the whole ecosystem. 
And you know, this is the securities token industry. Securities, it's regulated. And it's embryonic. You have a lot of players like uh, that are putting custody or ATSs for trading or transfer agents, all the pieces of the plumbing that's required, but we're all collectively as an industry still working it out and coming together and how it's gonna happen. So tokens are just, it, stocks and bonds are already electronic. You have yeah. them on a statement. You don't hold them, you know, right. you might maybe, but 99.99% <laughs> of people just have them on statement. Right. So <laughs> it's already electronic. So the token is just another type of electronic uh, ownership interest record. And, but it has a lot of cool features, as everyone in this room knows, a lot of cool features and uh, you know, ease of transferability. There's, it's just the next generation of, this, uh, of the securities industry. Great, well, thank you. Then that's all the time we have. Really appreciate um, your insights here, and thank you for listening. And uh, we'll be around if you want to ask any further questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.